Welcome everybody. Today we are going to be boarding that submarine right there, USS Indiana. I am just so excited. This is part of Fleet Week. Thank you for them inviting me out and letting me get on their ships. We're going to do different ships uh, tomorrow, but today we're actually going to be going on USS Indiana. This is an annual event here at Port Everglades in Fort Lauderdale where the members of the public can sign up to actually get on one of these ships. So it's your only opportunity to ever board one of these without actually joining the military. And today we are scheduled for an actual submarine. I am so excited. Look at that. I'm just so curious how we're going to board or how hard it is. Regardless, I have this GoPro to my chest. So if I need to go down any ladders, which I think that's how you get on, uh, I'll be able to show you guys all of that footage without having to, you know, put my camera down. All right, we're getting on the USS Cole. I think this is the way onto the submarine. There's a lot of armed service members. So it's a little bit unnerving, but this, this is so cool. There it is. The submarine, oh, this is so sketchy. Welcome everybody from the top of USS Indiana. This is a nuclear powered submarine as part of the Navy's fleet. And we're actually standing on top of a real life submarine. Check this out. And you can see the rest of it is underwater, of course. You know, I was wondering before I got here, how would we be boarding? So we actually have to cross into this ship. This is the USS Cole. And then right down these stairs right here. And then I guess this is where we're gonna be going inside shortly. We're gonna get an exclusive media tour of the submarine. It's better to walk along there to get a good hold. Yep. I don't know why we got water there. Hey. Hey, there's some water here. I don't know if that's for you. Water? Oh yeah, that's for the top side. But if you want some cheap, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm just wanted to hand it to you guys. We're doing it. We'll talk to you. We'll talk to you. We'll see if we can get like a... Make sure that makes sense down here. Maybe we can find that somewhere. Are you guys going to do this way? I'll have you come down. So, uh, one of the different things that uh, the newer Virginia class submarines have because the older the older submarines have their control room in the upper level So each level is three levels uh, our control room is in the middle level which will which I'll show you that it leaves a lot of room up here for all the, the ship the birthing for the crew uh, the crew is made up of about 150 sailors uh, We only have a hundred and about 112 racks I believe and so what that means is we'll do things called hot racking where we'll put three sailors in two racks and they'll cycle through with their duties, uh, whether it be training or stand and watch, whatever the case is. And this is uh, one of an example of uh, where the sailors will live. This is one of our six pack birthing areas. Each sailor gets their own rack, uh, unless they're hot racking, like I mentioned. And you know, again, put all their stuff underneath the rack. They got a foot locker here, and that's basically where they live. So one of the um, capabilities that Virginia class have is uh, a lockout trunk. So a lockout trunk, uh, we can support special operations forces. And what we'll be able to do that's unique to Virginia class is we put up to almost 20 special operations forces, their equipment in, in, into the lockout trunk. There's partitions up here now, so it looks like it's very confined behind the hatch here. But we'll pull those partitions out, uh, load this up, and you shut the hatches, flood down the lockout trunk, and they'll able to, they're able to lock in, lock out uh, uh, to be able to leave the ship and uh, recover the the sailors. We could also do, Virginia class can also do is support uh, a dry duck shelter, which is kind of like a garage in essence. Uh, it attaches to the top of, sh top of the ship and allows uh, the capability of having a seal delivery vehicle or different soft equipment that we can launch and recover uh, from topside, uh, all while we're, we're submerged under the water. The submarine is not made to drive on the surface. I mean, we're in, we're in essence a, a tube, and so we're not, we're not good at driving on the surface. It's just not what we're used to. So. Uh, where we're proficient, obviously, is when we're, we're uh, under the surface. So when we do things like uh, lockout trunk operations or we do anything where we're close to the surface, we'll be at periscope depth to where the entire ship is submerged with the exception of any masts that we have, like the periscope or any communications masts a uh, handful of feet above the uh, surface of the water. As you can tell, very uh, efficient use of space. That's why everything is just jammed in every spot we can find.
All right, so this is a control room. This is, again, the, the brains of a majority of our operations while we're submerged or even surfaced for that matter. Before we get into discussions of the control room, again, the submarine's cut into basically two distinct compartments right in half. The latter half uh, of the ship is the reactor compartment and the propulsion spaces, all of our uh, things associated with our nuclear power propulsion. Uh, again, we're nuclear powered, so we're only limited by the amount of food that we can have on board. We usually load anywhere from 6 to 120 days of food, uh, and that's the only thing that really can limit us. The forward compartment, three levels. We're in the, we're in the forward compartment middle level right now. Again, this is the control room. Uh, a couple of distinct parts of the control room. You wanna come up here? You have ships, the ship's control station, uh, and this is where we drive the ship from in essence. Older ships had multiple watch chainers that, that would sit here uh, and they would use actual mechanical operations where they would be able to turn left or right, move the ship up and down within the water column. What we do here, the pilot and the co-pilot, they fly the ship. Using the algorithm associated with the ship's control station, we're able to do as simple as when an order for a depth gets called, we enter that uh, order depth, hit enter, and the ship will fly to that whatever depth that we've asked. Yeah, the the computer would do that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's all an al algorithm. So you can operate this in automatic, you can operate it in, in, in manual if you want, but because of the automatic algorithm that the ship's control uses, uh, and it's very effective and, and does a great job, we use that the majority of the time. Do you rely on this one underwater, or is it just for surface, yeah, this video? So the, so what's, um, it's a good question. So one of the uh, great things is you look around the control room, all of these screens, there's uh, over 50 screens in control, and we have a system called uh, ADOS, which is any display anywhere, which allows us to uh, configure the control room with, for whatever mission we have going on. So right now, while we're on the surface, we have the periscope raised, which I'll talk about in a second. We can repeat that periscope uh, display uh, on one of these screens. We're doing a different mission. We'll be able to use these screens uh, for whatever makes the most sense for the mission that we're uh, accomplishing, right? A little about the ship's control uh, station. You can see as you look across these screens, these are all with the, in, with the advanced technology that uh, the Virginia class uses, all uh, touch screens. Uh, they control our air systems, our hydraulic systems, and our trim system, which uh, allows us to maintain buoyancy. As you can imagine, when the ship submerges, uh, that's important. When we do submerge, we have our ballast tanks. They're full of air right now when we're on the surface, and in essence, to uh, sink the ship uh, in a controlled manner. We'll open some vents on the top of our ballast tanks, uh, and they're open uh, on the bottom. All the water will flood in, right, and we'll and we'll submerge. You can see uh, over here. This shows all the tanks, our trim tanks, and the watch standers here with the touch screens are able to operate a series of valves and pumps to move water on and off the ship and forward and aft of the ship to be able to maintain that buoyancy. Just like an airplane, the, the um, dynamics of being able to maintain buoyant. If we're going fast enough, we use the planes, both our stern planes and our bow planes, to be able to maintain at a certain depth. The slower you go, if we're heavy, we'll sink. So they're able to put water on and off the ship to maintain that buoyancy uh, while we're operating. As you move back, this is the, con the command workstation. So uh, when the officer of the deck who is in charge of the watch section is standing watch, they're standing right here. This is kind of the con, so to speak. Similar to what I was discussing before, these screens are able to be able to, we're able to pick, pull up whatever we think is necessary, whether that's sonar screens, fire control screens, or the periscope. Uh, and here we have the periscope up. One of the unique things about the newer Virginia classes, uh, the older Virginia classes, Virginia classes, which again are not that old, uh, used to have a joystick to be able to control the periscope. They did a number of different studies uh, with a newer generation of uh, sailors that were coming in and said, hey, how can we make this more intuitive? How can we make it easier for them to get proficient faster, right? And they figured out the use of an Xbox controller, right? I mean, again, this is, this is an Xbox controller that, again, it shows you how you operate uh, each what you're doing with each piece is in part, whether that's changing the cameras that's, uh, from black and white to color, or we have infrared capability. We have uh, a number of different filters, again, to where we can use the periscope to accomplish a mission, and then most importantly, be able to keep the ship safe when we're periscoped up. You'd be surprised at the number of times got, uh, you know, sailors will come in, you know, new, new junior officers, having never operated the periscope, and just the intuitive nature of how this operates, whether you're zooming in, Changing, changing color or, or cameras or whatever the case is, it's very intuitive, much more so than the previous joystick. And the other benefit is the previous joystick was not cheap through the supply system. It was probably about you know $5,000. And these are like 60 bucks, right? The hardest thing about these, surprisingly, is that they're, they have cords where they, they don't really make these very much anymore because they're all like the Bluetooth. Yeah, you got it, right? So, um, very cool. So as we, as we move back over behind you guys, uh, on the port side uh, is the sonar shack. And that's where our sonar watch standers uh, will stay and watch. And what the key thing for these guys, this is our bread and butter, because again, when we go deep, 
uh, we don't have cameras, we don't have eyes, so we use our ears and we listen, and that's how we're able to understand what's around us. Through our series of different uh, arrays that we have, acoustic arrays, we'll put together, or we'll gather raw data, and the sonar, then the sonar team will analyze that data, both through their watch standards and the artificial intelligence that we have incorporated into our systems uh, to be able to figure out what that what they're listening to is. And, then, and they can tell the difference between, again, uh, a merchant or a warship or a, a fishing boat or a pleasure craft. They're able, based on acoustics, yeah, to listen and figure out what's what. They take all that raw data that they're able to get uh, from the sonar system and they send it over to behind you, which is the fire control system, and they take all that data put it into our, our system and come up with this uh, common operational picture in essence, right? So that puts us in a position to where we can keep the ship safe, right? While we're submerged and we, and we can't see. And then we also know what's around us, whatever mission we're doing. If we're doing a surveillance mission, we know what we're looking at. If we're doing, uh, we're, we're, you know, maintaining where uh, a merchant shipping lane is, we know where that is. We can put it down on our, our uh, operational picture. So we, again, can stay safe and, and accomplish that mission. What's the maximum depth that this submarine uh, unfortunately, I can't tell you that, but it's in okay. hundreds of feet below the surface. When we do go deep and we log off uh, whatever communication circuit we're on, um, it, we're alone and unafraid, right? We, are, we have to make decisions on our own because we don't have that reach back to our operational commander. And it puts us in a, real, in a unique situation where we got to make decisions on our own with regard to mission success or whatever the case is. So if there's like a call for like, a, like an enemy threat, someone on this submarine has to make that final decision on whether to engage? It depends. but. Sort of. I mean, that's the level of decisions that you could get to. Uh, we get direction, and unfortunately, our operational commanders, for the most part, with it, whether we're deployed or we're operating the locals, uh, give us a lot of uh, independence as a as an operate as an operating team uh, to make a lot of those decisions. Probably not as that that grave with regard to actually engaging a, an adversary, whatever the case is. But that, I don't think that's that, that out of the question. And I think there's a lot of faith in you know in a submarine crew to be able to understand what's going on have enough direction to where it's not being, you know, micromanaged by the operational commander by any means, uh, but then ultimately make that, that decision, whether it's uh, as intense as what kind of you referenced or just, uh, hey, I have multiple missions I need to accomplish and I have multiple opportunities. Which one's the most important one? I'm gonna go, you know, I have A, B, or C. I'm gonna choose C because I think this is the right answer. And I don't have to go up and check with my boss if that's okay or yeah. not. One of the things I'll, I'll point out to you guys is as you're walking here, you see these panels uh, in the deck, the floor decking, um, whenever you have to load a torpedo, and you'll see how large a torpedo is when we go to the torpedo room, um, but in order to load that weapon, you take it from top side, and, and you can see these pieces and parts up here. Um, we, in essence, build an erector set almost top side that, is allowed, that allows us to take a torpedo, load it into the ship at an angle, kind of like this, and it goes right through the ship, through the, like right where we're standing. These, all these uh, uh, floor deck decking is taken up and goes down into the torpedo room. So we basically cut the ship in half lengthwise in order to load torpedoes because they're so large. So this is the lap of luxury. This is my stateroom. All I, you know, probably 25 to 30 square foot feet, right? It's okay, sir. Yeah, please. Um, you know, I was pretty fortunate to have the, the room I do and the privacy I do, which is, which is kind of cool. So you can see the, the table in there will fold into the wall and then my, my bed folds out of the, of the, of the wall. Um, the racks I know for certain are about six and a half feet long because I'm six and a half feet long and I'm about as <laughs> tall as I can get to, on the rack and they're about as wide as your shoulders. Um, and you can see that across, you know, everybody has the same size rack on board um, and you think, man, that's, that's tough to be able to accommodate. But when we got, when our guys and me included hit the rack, we were pretty tired. So we could pretty basically sleep anywhere. This is the executive officer stateroom. You'll notice he has two racks, one, one above and then one below where the uh, curtains are pulled. Um, anytime we have any VIPs or uh, senior officers on board, they'll bunk with the XO. Uh, we were talking countermeasures earlier. Um, this, so this is our internal countermeasure space, and you can see the two tubes there. Uh, these lockers are, are loaded with our countermeasures, and we load those in, and this is where we shoot those countermeasures should we need to. Um, and flares, like some of you guys you had mentioned earlier. Uh, interestingly enough, too, you saw the XO and my staterooms. That's kind of our both our where we sleep, where we work, our offices. Um, the chief of the boat, this is Mike McKelly, he's Master Chief Mike McKelly. Uh, he's the senior enlisted on board. Uh, that also doubles as his office, so you can see, uh, we, again, very efficient use of space across the board. Yeah, yeah. So we saw some berthing uh, up, you know, up in fourth compartment, upper level. So um, the officers on board are in staterooms. Uh, this is an example of one of our staterooms. We have four staterooms on board, three racks, two desks, uh, and again, one officer is probably on watch, uh, while the other two are either doing work 
or in the rack, whatever the case is. And so we have uh, three other state rooms just like that one. All right, we'll head down to the torpedo room. So it's a good question. Um, we, we again, we operate on a 24-hour day. I'll explain to this when we get in the torpedo room. Come on in. Sure. We operate on a 24-hour day, working day. So it's uh, and we do three shifts. So it's eight hours. So, you, so as a nominal person on board, you'll stand eight hours of watch, and then you'll have eight hours of offgoing. And that eight hours of offgoing is like training. You know, personal time, maintenance, different things like that, and then you have eight hours dedicated to, towards getting some sleep, and that's basically our 24-hour day. The submarine force used to do a six-hour, uh, like an 18-hour day, where it was a six-hour watch rotation, similar to that. Uh, and then we found that your um, circadian rhythm was very off when you slept at a different time every day, and it caused you know watch centers to be more tired, different things like that. And we shifted, uh, you know, probably about 10 years ago. Uh, into this, into the eight, the eight-hour watch rotation, i.e., the 24-hour day, and it's made a world of difference with regard to watch standing and effectiveness. While uh, guys are able to stay a lot more attentive uh, while they're standing watch, and it's just easier on, I think, your body with regard to the stressors of being on a submarine. Um, so this is a torpedo room. The uniqueness of the Virginia class torpedo room is that on older ships, you uh, only really had these two paths that were basically right here because everything else was full of areas to store weapons. Uh, Virginia class torpedo, the torpedo rooms uh, and the torpedoes that we load um, are each weapon has one of these cradles and you can see a torpedo there loaded in one of these cradles, right? Um, when the weapon's not in a cradle or we don't have weapons on board, we're able to take these similar to this one. Again, this is another one right here. These, cr these cradles are stacked and we're able to stack the cradles and move them out of the way to give us a little bit more space down here. Uh, that space can be used from anything from training to just leisure space for the guys. Again, space is a, a, hot, a hot commodity on board, and if we can give more space to the, the crew to either relax or train, or you know, sometimes we'll have workout equipment down here, we'll take full advantage of that. So torpedoes are about uh, 3,500 pounds a piece, um, and again, incredibly capable uh, weapon system, internal navigation system, internal sonar system, um, really, really capable weapon uh, that. We put a lot of effort into making sure that whatever our shot is, is right when it leaves the ship. Uh, but its ability to, to, uh, to correct itself is, is pretty awesome. We'll go up here and check out uh, one of the torpedo tubes. Again, we have uh, four torpedo tubes on board, two port and two starboard. Uh, you guys are welcome to, here's a flashlight, take a look in there. Here. And good, in, in order to, uh, Load a weapon, we'll set it up on the load line, which is the one right behind you. And each one of our tubes is not, uh, is not in line with the ship. It's just canted outward barely, right? And so when a weapon's on this load line, uh, it, it gets lined up with the weapon and then pivots so you get that angle. And then we use the electric systems uh, that we have within the room to push the, the weapon into the tube. We'll shut that large um, door behind you. Again, once the weapon's in, the door's shut, the weapon's hooked up. Internally to the um, the tube, we hook up the weapons, and that, that kind of the, our ability to be able to continue uh, communications with the weapon once it leaves. Hook all that stuff up, shut the door. We'll flood the tube down in order to get the weapon. If we're going to shoot it, uh, we in essence pressurize the tube enough and use a, a ejection pump to push the weapon out of the ship. And then the weapon's smart enough to know that that hey, I'm outside of the ship. I'm going to start up all my systems, including the engine, and go. The entire time maintaining that continuity. Uh, via the wire so we can update the solution that it has or, or provided any updated information from the data that we're getting up in the control room. Uh, as you move over here, so what you'll see uh, is the, the continuing changing technology associated with our systems. So right here, all these systems are uh, the ones that control the torpedo tubes. You can see how they're uh, kind of the analog with the analog systems, the digital readouts, lots of switches. Then you transition over here, these screens, we have a, a vertical launch system on board. Uh, with you know a missile system up forward in our forward ballast tanks, those are you know can carry anything from tomahawks to a couple other different uh, weapon systems. But all of these are all touch screens, and so again the technology continues to advance with our newer missile system that we have on board, which is called the, the, the newer Virginia classes have a Virginia payload tubes, which is in essence two large uh, and you can see them topside. I'm not sure if you had a chance to see them, but two large tubes uh, that open like this, and they have in essence almost it looks like a revolver, like a six shooter in there. Uh, with our weapons uh, in each tube, so we have 12 uh, tomahawks. You can see how a lot of these blankets are, are hung up down here. 
what we do is we, you know, we talked about birthing and the availability of rack space. Yeah. When we have the opportunity, we'll actually put racks down in the torpedo room to again, minimize the number of guys that have to do that hot racking. I don't want to touch any of that. <laughs> I want to be blamed. No, you're good. I really appreciate this. Sir. Sure, you. absolutely. No, it's great to have you guys on board. I mean, any opportunity from my perspective to, in essence, show you guys stuff and consequently brag on my crew because they're great, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll take advantage. For the kids, like, what does it take to be a submariner or even like a, a head of the uh, submarine? I mean, so I'll tell you, I think I think anybody can do it. Don't get me wrong. Uh, when, when guys enlist, they have to take, or you know, when soon to be future sailors enlist, they take a, an exam called the ASVAB. That puts you in a position of you understand based on that ASVAB score, you have different options available to you. Uh, I think the uniqueness of the submarine force puts up, presents uh, is there's a lot of smart people in the submarine force, and you can tell by um, you know just our daily operations and that you know what we do is very dangerous. Uh, it's very technical, uh, but we do it really really well, and that's that's a reflection of the people uh, and you know their ability to understand what we're doing, what's important, what's you know, you know what's wrong, what's right different things like that. And you know, having a nuclear reactor on board, uh, that's a big deal. And, and you, so you, you look at our crew, so we're sitting about 150, give or take, of the crew. The average age for the folks on board is about 25, right? So you have really, really young sailors and really, really smart sailors, which is, which is pretty awesome. That's reflective, again, in our operations, yeah. And when you ask what it takes to, be, to, to get in my position, I think I just got lucky, you know what I mean? This is a crew's mess. Yeah, this is where the crew eats. We also do, uh, you know, training in here. Uh, it's also an opportunity for the crew just to relax and hang out, um, watch movies, play video games. Again, just relax. And you can tell by looking at the place, uh, the state of Indiana uh, heavily supports us. A lot of great support from the state of Indiana, and you can see right, the reflection there with the cream, cream and crimson, crimson uh, that matches the University of Indiana. One of the cool things that uh, the ship got when we were commissioned as the commissioning committee put together a number of tables for the crew. And you can see here, this, is a, this commemorates the Navy Notre Dame at the end there. Um, football game each year. Uh, there's a couple other ones with like a basketball, like, you know, obviously Indiana University and Purdue, very high-end basketball programs. Uh, but what's cool about these uh, tables and similar to the one I'll show you in the wardroom, so this is wood all indigenous to the state of Indiana, which is, which is cool. And you wonder where, like, a good example of some uniqueness associated with this table is this white is actually an Indiana white sycamore. It's a unique, rare uh, tree that they were able to cultivate and use that wood uh, for this table, which is very cool. So uh, I, I think you probably smell it, but the food on board a submarine is exceptional. Uh, I think it's the best food in the Navy. The biggest driver on why the food's so good, so you can see obviously space is at a premium. We have one freezer, one refrigerator, and then basically put food everywhere else if we can. They have to make everything from scratch. So instead of having loaves of bread, you know, for 150 guys, uh, guys and gals to eat on, you know, whatever period, periodic basis, they make all, all their baked goods from scratch. And it's really, really good. Um, uh, you know, if you're gonna make cookies at home, you probably go to the grocery store and you get like butter or something like that. Shortening, you know, the best cookies you've ever had from scratch on it. And, and I mean, the, the ship on a, you can always tell what the food is because you can smell it across the ship. The ventilation system moves that smell around. It's awesome. Um, and these guys, these guys are very good. Uh, there's no open fire here. No, uh, no. So we have a couple ovens and a big flat top, similar to you see. In the, I mean, it's a commercial grade uh, kitchen. Um, we're very lucky that the submarines come. You know, the USS Cole. That I had the CEO of the Cole came down, and we walked around. And he's like, "You have deep fat fryers? They don't have deep fat fryers on the Cole. We do, uh, which just means like again, French fries, mozzarella sticks. You know." Fried food is a good thing, obviously, as you can imagine. Uh, we got to be conscious of that because, you know, with these guys and their ability to, to cook, uh, you can physically kind of get out of hand if you eat too much. Uh, but man, the food on board is awesome. These guys are really, really good. Is there like a rotating menu? There is. So uh, about every two weeks, it it, uh, it rotates to different meals. Like there are the every Tuesday's Taco Tuesday for lunch. It's not necessarily tacos, but it's like, you know, uh, burritos, quesadillas, or enchiladas, but some kind of like, um, Taco Tuesday kind of themed meal every Tuesday. We do uh, burgers every uh, Friday for lunch. They're burgers, I mean, it's, they're unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, so, so you talk about, there's no frozen patties. 
they have ground beef and they hand make all the patties themselves and they cook them themselves. So, and our burgers aren't just plain. Again, the buns, uh, burger buns are made from scratch. The, the patty is made from scratch. They also, uh, they'll fry up eggs to put it on it. These guys make this, um, it's awesome. They make this jalapeno bacon relish. It tastes as good as it sounds, awesome. So when you go get a burger uh, from these guys, it's, it's like something you get at a restaurant. And it's really, really good. And then we do uh, every Saturday night and then every night before we pull into port, we'll do pizza night. And again, they make all the dough from scratch, uh, make all the pizzas from scratch. And the pizza's really good. Uh, Oh, you, so it's funny that they, they'll, uh, the cooks, they'll get to know who's who and what they like. Oh, and so they'll be like, oh, what do you like? Oh, you know, you want that person. like, yeah. And they'll make pizzas for like a handful of guys like, oh, I want this, this, and this. And they'll be like, oh, we got your pizza ready. You know, so, so these guys really accommodate us personally. And it's not just a, talking with the crew, we, it's, it's, like a, it's like a family atmosphere, you know. We don't have to be best friends with each other. But that family mentality of being like, hey, you know, maybe today I'm kind of, uh, you know, annoyed with you, but you know you're my family, so I'll get over it. You know, because the stressors of a submarine, it's really good to be able to manage that stress with each other. I.e., hey, I'm, you know, this is bothering me. Oh, that's bothering me too. You know, you know, that kind of strength with, with as a group. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. And so that turns into the again, this place is like home. You know, and it's got to be when you're talking about being underway or away from home for an extended period of time. Over the, about the last two years, the Indiana has been away from home port about 55 percent of the time. So we're gone away from our families, away from our homes uh, on land more often than we're not. All right, we'll head into the wardroom. I'll show you that. And then I'll get any other questions you guys got, I'm open. So one of the unique things about a submarine is there's one medical professional on board, uh, our doc, and he takes care of everybody. Um, He's got a small space that you don't need to see. It's not that exciting. But something that's interesting about this, so this is the wardroom. This is where the officers eat. We have operational briefs in here. And again, it's where the uh, wardroom, got members of the wardroom where the officers get a chance to relax. Um, I mentioned the dock because this is also Doc's operating table should he need to operate on someone, right? Um, so again, huge use of space, multiple different uses for uh, different things. Uh, but again, this table, so this table, uh, again, made of wood indigenous to Indiana and is a replica of a table that's about three times the size of this that's in the governor's office uh, in the state of Indiana, which is, which is very cool. Uh, it has all the um, counties of Indiana around the edge. And, we're, we're, and the uniqueness of this table, one, that it's a, you know, one of one, but there's also something that, uh, that I think anecdotally is pretty funny, is we have, it's a, there's a typo on it. It should be Randolph, right? It's kind of funny. I mean, it, 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 again, this is incredibly unique in its own right. Yeah, and yeah, so it's very cool. Yeah, I mean, so I'll tell you that, you know, being on a, a five-year-old nuclear-powered warship that goes underneath the water is pretty awesome. Um, again, in the, the state of Indiana gave us that. And this, what this shows, so, so this is obviously us, and then shows us the, the uh, our pays homage to the previous USS Indiana's uh, BB-1 and BB-58, and there was actually an Indiana that was being built in the shipyard that didn't actually get finished, so it pays homage to that there, too. So if there's a tsunami, you guys can still be affected underwater. Sure, yeah. absolutely. I mean, it's interesting. Uh, uh, so when, we're on the, when you're on the surface and you have heavy waves, yeah. you know, again, we're, a, we're a, a round tube, so we don't handle that well on the surface. You know, you guys will kind of not, not be feeling too hot. Uh, but once we submerge, you really don't feel that. We did have the opportunity. I've had the opportunity to go... Uh, I, you know, bend deep underneath a hurricane and you go fairly deep and you can still feel some rock and rolls uh, if the hurricane's bad enough. But for the most part, once you go under the, under the surface, yeah, it's, it's very, it's just like you are, it's just, I mean, we could be hundreds of feet below the surface right now and it's just like this. I got a question on one of the tours, uh, maybe yesterday or the day before, I say, how long have you been underneath? Like, uh, and then for me, it was, it's about 70, 75 days. You know, you submerge and you don't come back up. Um, but, you, I mean, if, if I told you to go in your house and you just happen to be in your house for two months, two mo I mean, that's crazy to say, but uh, it, it's nice to see the sun, don't get me wrong, it's not, but uh, it's not as bad as you think it is, right? Some people ask about being claustrophobic on board. It's tight. I mean, you guys have seen it. It's tight, but it's not Certainly crazy. Much. What do you guys do with the, the waste here? Oh, so we collect it and then uh, we dispose of it depending, or we separate it and dispose of it uh, as the environmental requirements allow. Uh, a lot of times, depending on the type of waste, we'll just keep it on station and when we pull back in, we'll take it up and you know, 
having you guys come down is an opportunity to basically brag about the crew, brag about the ship. I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, my opinion, this is my opinion, right? Um, technology you guys have seen is exceptional, right? Um, torpedo alone. I mean, awesome, right? Uh, all that stuff's great. Submarining, the missions that we do, awesome. Like, I mean, super cool, right? The reason that I've been in for 20 years is the people. Like, submariners are unique, kind of like we talked about. Uh, it's absolutely the people that, that keep me around. Uh, and, it, and this crew especially is exceptional. I mean, great group of people, really high-performing men and women uh, that have, you know, continue to find no ceiling in their performance, which is awesome, which it, makes my job really easy, where I just kind of sit around and I'm like, great, I'm just going to sit here and let you guys work. And then, and, you know, every once in a while I'll be like, hey, have you thought about this? And they're like, Captain, we don't need your help. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go back to my stateroom and you guys to take care of business. Absolutely. Sir. Oh, this is great. Thanks Thank very you. much. Thank you very much. I learned oh, that from one very of the cool. guys. If someone did something good for you, you give well, it hey. back. Hey, thank Thanks. you, sir. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thanks thank for having you. Great having you guys on board. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Well, again, thanks. Thank you so thanks much. Thank, thank you. you for all the information. Absolutely. This was a cool experience. Take care. Thank you. Just be careful getting in and getting out. It's pretty tight. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's amazing. We're done with the submarine tour. This is so cool. How cool was that? We just went on a submarine. Thank you so much to the commanding officer, which is the one that gave us the tour. He gave me this really cool coin with his name on it. Presented by the commanding officer, the USS Indiana. This is so cool, I'm gonna keep this forever. Thank you so much to the Navy for giving this opportunity to me to show you guys the, the force, the power, the capabilities of the military. That's why this event even exists. And I'm just so happy and honored to be here. So thank you so much for watching. I will catch you guys in the next video. So our ship in the bow, there are seven and a half tons of steel from the World Trade Center. The fun fact here is the door in the back is actually a two person morgue. Cause unfortunately not everyone here comes back breathing. Welcome to the pilot house. This is where we drive the ship from.